Okay, any questions about the books of the Bible before we get going? No? Okay, we'll start off looking at 1 Samuel. Uh, we're getting pretty far in the history books. Uh, so what happens in 1 first, uh, first Samuel? Uh, at the beginning of 1 Samuel, 1 uh, uh, Samuel is really a book about transitions. At the very beginning, uh, they're still pretty much just scattered tribes. And uh, they get their first king. And he moves it more into like a chieftain, uh, and then Second Samuel sees that chieftain, chieftain kind of be turned into a kingdom. Uh, so an interesting uh, development there. There's four things to consider about First Samuel. The first thing, um, getting a king was not against God's will. It was the timing of getting a king that was against God's will. And there's a very important point to make with that. Uh, a lot of times we read the story, oh, this is not what, no, no. But if you read Deuteronomy, though, God did mention that. Eventually, they would get a king. Um, it's just that this wasn't the right time. Uh, and I mean, it, that's kind of the way it is with God oftentimes. It's, it might be a good idea, but maybe not a good idea for right now. Uh, the second thing to point out about First Samuel, uh, Samuel discusses the difference between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. So in Deuteronomy, it was really uh, more of the letter of the law, but in First Samuel, it, you, you see them t it has a lot of gray things that happen. Uh, a good example of this would be David goes and eats the bread uh, from the table. He's not supposed to do that. Uh, but yet, God didn't punish him for it. And um, it's just kind of a good example of, of how the book kind of deals with more of the spirit of the law, not, not, not the letter of the law. Uh, then the third thing to consider with First Samuel, um, King Saul is afflicted by an evil spirit. And it's important not to sugarcoat what the Bible clearly says. The evil spirit was sent by God. It was from God. Um, whatever that does to your theology is kind of something you have to figure out. But the Bible is absolutely clear that it does come from God. Um, and disobedience oftentimes leads to, leads, leads to different kinds of afflictions. Uh, King Saul isn't the only one that that's happened to. Uh, the fourth thing is uh, we kind of live in a <laughs> an age of doctors, which is fine. But a lot of times people kind of go on like WebMD or whatever and they kind of diagnose things when they have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, it would be wise not to diagnose Saul or David with or anybody, really. Uh, it's so far after the fact. And, I mean, there could be a lot of things. It's, it's just better not to better not to go down that road. Uh, so it was written, we don't really know exactly when it was written, but the final edit of it happened sometime after the kingdom was divided. So after 722. Um, because it, sa it mentions um, some cities that were still uh, occupied at the time, um, which changed after the Israel uh, after Israel was divided. So they would have only mentioned that as it was written uh, afterwards, obviously. So once again, though, th that doesn't mean that it was written all at once. We've mentioned this with numerous books. Uh, they could have been written and then edited later. Uh, it's totally possible. Uh, when did the events happen? So King Saul's reign is, is an interesting thing. Uh, we don't really know how long it was. Uh, there's one chapter that says he reigned two years. And the problem is, is just how, what that verse is trying to say. Some people think that it was, it, the, the text was, was corrupted and it should say 42 years or 22 years. Some people think it's not talking about how long he reigned, but rather how long he reigned until the thing happened. In other words, he had reigned, he had reigned a year and then this happened. And uh, I guess both, both things are possible, but at the end of the day, all that we have is, is the reference of two years. Um, so depending on when King Saul became king, it happened from question mark, 1010 BC, and then Second Samuel has them from 1010 BC to 970 BC. Um, so maybe you could say 1080 forward. That gives enough time for um, Samuel to have been born, uh, to become a prophet, and the last judge, uh, and then for King Saul to have been anointed, and then for King David to have been anointed. So, uh, as far as who wrote it, another unknown. <laughs> you would think that it was written by Samuel, but. Uh, Samuel dies halfway through the first book, so <laughs> so I guess that's not a thing. <laughs> um, he might have written some of it, obviously. Uh, you see a lot of times the prophets uh, functioned as uh, kind of record keepers. So he, he might have definitely written some of it. Um, as there's also possibly the idea that um, there was kind of like a school 
uh, school might be a little bit of an overstatement. Uh, kind of like Samuel had some disciples, possibly, uh, that kind of took it upon themselves to copy and preserve. Uh, it's possible, but, I mean, once again, without anything solid, you're kind of just left guessing. Uh, the main theme of First Samuel, this is really interesting because when people think of the Old Testament, they think of, you know, kind of like, boring laws or stories that don't really have to do with anything. But in 1 Samuel, um, it definitely contradicts that idea. Uh, you could say the main theme of 1 Samuel is the heart. Um, for instance, it's in 1 Samuel that the statement is made, David is a man after God's own heart. That's from 1 Samuel. Um, you see Hannah's heart shown against the other wife. There's like this kind of competition between this guy and his two wives. Hannah's wife, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Hannah as the wife, her heart comes shining through, even to the point where the priest who is uh, living in, in immorality and his kids are living in immorality, um, th even he thinks that she's nothing but a drunk. So, I mean, this is uh, kind of a reverse of things. Then you see Saul shows his bad heart. David shows his good heart. Uh, you, all throughout the book, the heart is really the emphasis, and you just see it keep coming up over and over again, even to the point where somebody's position isn't really the main point like uh, you see you see people in low station and people in high station and, and not really being a factor of the factor being the heart as far as an outline for the book uh there i'll give you a more specific outline but it's worth mentioning that pretty much the entire first samuel is a contrast between the character of saul and david you see them constantly kind of back and forth and you'll see something when it mentions king saul you, you'll see it worded a certain way and then later when David comes into the picture, you see the wording r reflecting back to how it was talking about King Saul. Uh, so pay attention to the details included and if they relate to previous or later stories. Um, uh, but uh, but you, can, you can still outline the book in a, in a relatively simple way in, in two sections. Chapter 1 through 15 is kind of a transitional period. It talks about uh, Samuel, you know, being raised up and, and, and him becoming the last judge. And then verses, and also the tail end of that, it's a transition between judges to kingdom. Uh, and then in chapters 15 through 31, you see this slow decline of Saul. And it just gets worse and worse for the guy. Uh, meanwhile, you see David uh, rising. And you see him getting in a better and better position. Um, and it's kind of a, a switch of fortunes there, I guess you could say. So, so what? What does it matter that King that? First Samuel is in our Bible. Well, there's a few things. First off, First Samuel gives us the best picture of Saul and Samuel. Um, very important figures that really just aren't mentioned too much later on. Uh, I believe Chronicles mentions Saul's, you know, lineage, but it doesn't really mention too much of his uh, time as king. Um, then Samuel is a judge, but he's not mentioned in the book of Judges. Uh, and then the n another thing that makes First Samuel kind of re really unique is alongside kings, so, so kind of see First Samuel and Second and, and, and Samuel and First Kings and Second Kings, kind of see them as a as a unit, if you will. Uh, and uh, alongside with the books of Kings, Samuel includes very weighty issues that are kind of hard to digest. There, a great example of this um, is there's this story. It's actually this part. This one's actually in Kings, but these kinds of stories are in Samuel as well. Um, where there's a, a bunch of kids, and they start making fun of this prophet, calling him a bald, ed, bald head. And uh, he turns around and curses them, and two bears come out and slaughter all the boys. Uh, it's stories like that, that it's like, okay, what on earth does that have to say to us today? <laughs> and that's kind of what I'm talking about. Th they, they have all these very weighty issues um, that are just hard to digest, and, and they're there for a reason. Obviously, we can't go into all of that in this, but, you know, just mentioning it. Uh, th there is a strong emphasis on the heart over station or position, which is more dominant than any other biblical book that I can think of. Um, it, it shows you a clear story to apply those things to as well. So whereas Paul will say, hey, do this or don't do that, or hey, uh, this is what you should uh, believe or whatever, in First Samuel, it doesn't say it like that. It says, hey, here's a story that kind of shows you that it, there's more to it than just the letter of the law. It's really an interesting book. Uh, and that takes us to Second Samuel. What happens in Second Samuel? Well, David, uh, King David reigns over Israel. That's pretty much the entire book. Uh, when you pick up in First Kings, uh, David's hardly even mentioned. He's almost like a B character. Which, once again, is kind of interesting considering the fact that 
David was, you know, the ideal king for most Jews. Um, obviously not the bit where he uh, murdered his friend to take his wife, but uh, the rest of it, the other, <laughs> the good parts. <laughs> uh, so it's... Uh, Three things to consider about Second Samuel. The first thing, the Bible oftentimes records something without condoning it. And uh, this is an important distinction to make in the biblical stories because a lot of times when you're talking to people like atheists or, or uh, Wiccans or different people, different people groups like that, they're going to bring up uh, about how the Bible condones or even sometimes they'll use the word in commands, uh, you know, as to do these immoral things. It really, it doesn't, though. It, it, the Bible recording that somebody did something isn't saying go and do likewise. It's just saying, hey, and they did this. You know, like, so for instance, it mentions that Jesus went out and tempted, I'm sorry, Satan went out and tempted Jesus uh, in the desert. It, that doesn't mean we should go out <laughs> and tempt people in the desert. <laughs> Obviously not. And so why, why, why would we take it in the stories of the Bible that, oh, hey, this happened, therefore it's condoning it. And it's like, the, sometimes people just, I think, let their hate for something kind of cloud their rational thought. Uh, the second thing to kind of consider about Second Samuel is you see a good example in Second Samuel of what's called generational curses. Well, there's a lot of people who go back and forth with this. Oh, I believe them and I, oh, I don't. But Second Samuel really gives a good picture of that. So there are some things that affect those after you. You can call it a generational curse if you want, but uh, whatever. It, it's a consequence of your action. Um, if I... Uh, murder Gracie. I'm a great example here. If I murder Gracie, that's going to scar my children. It's going to affect those after me. You can call it a generational curse if you want. Uh, either way, it is something that there's going to be con consequences. Um, then there's the next thing. So Jesus breaks every chain, but we might still experience ill effects of something that's happened in our past. You see what I mean? Just because Jesus breaks every chain doesn't mean I'm not going to go to jail for murdering somebody. You see what I mean? He'll forgive me. He will you know, guide me in, in that, but that doesn't mean that I won't have to suffer for the consequences that I've made. And Second Samuel is a great example of that. So uh, we're going to get to this in just a minute, but the book breaks down into two sections. Um, at the beginning of the book, really chapters 1 through, what do I have written down? 10. You have David's success. Uh, nothing but success. Everything that he does, it's just working out. It's, uh, it's going great. But then right in the middle of the book, chapters 11 through 12, it has this whole adultery thing that happens. Uh, he murders his friend, who was one of his mighty men. This was a good fighter. He was a good, good. He wasn't just like a common soldier. This was like one somebody that David picked out from a lineup. This is a really skilled guy. Uh, and he, after you know, he 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 not after he he sleeps with his wife and then he murders him. Uh, but you know, he's got this whole thing that happens there. And then the, the child dies and just gets to be this whole big issue. And then everything after that, you see David's failures. Everything goes bad for David. I mean, it is thing after thing after thing. And this is a great example of generational curses. So was God's covenant still firm over Israel? Yes. Was God's agreement, which was made in 2 Samuel, to David that his children would always reign in Jerusalem, but was, that, was that fulfilled? Yes, absolutely. God didn't turn his back on that. But did David carry the consequences of his action to the point of death? Yes, yes he did. So you see, that's a, a Second Samuel is a great example of what a generational curse looks like in what it looks like today. Um, the consequences still might follow you, but yet God's promises will also follow you. So you kind of have those that, that back and forth there. Um, <coughs> then the third thing to mention about Second Samuel, uh, it brings up an interesting question. This is a question that I, I kind of weigh in my own heart uh, constantly, and I just I haven't figured it out yet. But Second Samuel addresses it. It doesn't necessarily give us an answer, but it gives us, um, well, I'll just say it. Uh, how do we walk in victory when our sin got us into the mess that we can't get out of? How do you still walk in victory when you sinned and it got you in a mess and you, you're still living with the consequences of that? How do you get out of it? I, I don't know. Well, you, see, you look at Samuel and you see, uh, sorry, Second Samuel, and you see that this happens with David. And so is it something where he was constantly living with the guilt of what he'd done? Was it something where he was able to move past it? Or was it not really moving past it, but just trusting God in the process? I don't know. I, it's an interesting question. Uh, but I don't really know that Second Samuel answers it, but it addresses it. So uh, it was written same time as First Samuel. Um, first Samuel. 
First Samuel and Second Samuel are pretty much one book. There's a lot of times it, th- the Jews had like one book, uh, and it was kind of separated into two. Now this happens with Kings. Kings is really one book, but it was separated into, into two for the sake of, of scrolls, because you scrolls are only so big, and you kind of want to make it where you can write it all in one normal size scroll. Uh, and so there's that. First and Second Samuel is a good example. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, that's pretty much one. They're connected. Um, it, it repeatedly throughout the, uh, throughout the Old Testament especially. Um, so the Bible obviously is one book, but it, it's really a book made up of books if you look at it. Because the, the law, you remember we looked at this with the law. The law is pretty much five books that are like one. They all pick up the story right after the other one. They're connected. The themes are repeated. You know, something mentioned in book four directly answers something mentioned in book two. Uh, you see in chapter in, in Genesis, you see all these people having these relationships, and then you get to the law, and it says, hey, don't have those kinds of relationships. And it doesn't, we don't really put the pieces together until we read Genesis and then Leviticus and Numbers back to back, and we're like, oh, that's what he's talking about. Like, for instance, the story of Jacob. Uh, he, he agrees to, um, to work for his uh, uncle or whatever uh, for was it like seven years, and in return he's going to get Rachel. Well, <laughs> the dad pulls a little bit of a <laughs> bad joke on him, <laughs> and he wakes up with Leah, uh, which I don't know if there was alcohol involved or if there was just a face covering. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, whatever happened there, uh, what was he supposed to have done? Well, the law tells us that he shouldn't have taken Rachel as a wife after, he, after Leah was his wife. So that's something where it's like, oh, but he should have followed his heart because that's how we think nowadays. But the law was very clear that, no, uh, he should not have taken Rachel. He should not have taken a sister. You don't do that. Uh, he should have stayed with, with, with Leah, which is kind of, I guess it's sad day for him, but, you know, eh. Uh, but anyways, it, my, my point being, if you read the law apart from Genesis, you're going to miss how it connects with real-life situations. So it happened, well, I already mentioned this, from 1010 to 970. The author, same as First Samuel, who uh, it was obviously the same person or people, but really we can't know past that. Uh, the main theme of Second Samuel is, like I mentioned, it, it's, it's, it's this verses. You've got God's covenant with David versus sin's impact with David. And so you have both of them kind of going back to back between those, between those two things. The outline, uh, if you read the book, be- it begins and ends with problems. David's facing a bunch of problems and trying to, you know, solidify the kingdom. It ends with him facing a bunch of problems, uh, you know, that are kind of cascading. Uh, so we, it, it, but as far as that, you can break the chapters into three sections. Chapters one through ten, uh, David um, has success. I already mentioned this before. Eleven through twelve, David has adultery. Uh, chapters thirteen through tw- twenty-four, David has a bunch of failures. Uh, so, so what? What does it? What does it matter? What? Do, what does Second Samuel really contribute to the Bible? And uh, I think there's a lot of things um, that we do. First off, keep in mind not to separate it too far from First Samuel, kind of with that. But uh, first off, our choices matter. Even if you are saved by grace, your choices still matter. You know, um, the things that we choose to do or choose not to do, they have, they have consequences. You know, these pastors that commit suicide, uh, that scars the church for a really long time. This is something that they have a really hard time moving past. Uh, whenever there's any kind of adultery or, or anything like that with leadership, it's something that scars the people, it scars the family, it's, it, it leaves disaster in its wake. It's not good. Uh, and and it, you can be a Christian and still your choices still matter. Uh, the second thing is uh, uh, part of Second Samuel's importance uh, is really tied to First Samuel and to First and Second Kings. Um, if you take it by itself, uh, y- I think you lose some of its importance. But if you read it alongside those other three, it kind of means a lot more. So kings we're going to look at together. We're going to kind of look at it as a, as a united whole, first and second kings. What happens? Oh, boy, a lot of stuff happens. But we're going to summarize it like this. Israel declines as a nation due to their immorality. I think that's a good way of, of, of summarizing what happens there. And uh, w- kings is really big on this. Sin has a very big degrading effect. And I think this is, this is the problem. We as Christians, and, and even necessarily people outside of the church that are still reading the Bible, you read in the New Testament and you sometimes miss things that the Old Testament was real big on. You know what I mean? Like, what New Testament book do you really see sin 
having a degrading effect on the society? Not really any one book, but in Kings, it's the main theme, you know. So then w- I- if, like a lot of people do nowadays, you go to the New Testament with very limited knowledge of the Old Testament, you're going to miss that there are things that are still true from the Old Testament. You're just going to miss that because, oh, the Old Testament's not for us today. And you just miss this whole big thing that, is, that, uh, that uh, did a lot of words proving. So uh, a couple things to consider about First and Second Kings. I'm going to mention ten things. First off, uh, kings, the b- first and second, use a series uh, of, 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 of uh, sources, and it cites them. Um, it, there's, uh, I can't remember all of them, but there are quite a few books throughout um, that it references. And uh, you'll see it when you're reading through it about, oh, th- this is from the book of that, or this is written in the book of that, or this prophecy, which was mentioned by the prophet in his book. You know, and, and none of those books we have record of. They've been long long since lost or destroyed, but yet King s- cites them. Um, and so this is not something that he was just making stuff up. He was citing sources that the people knew. The second thing to consider about First and Second Kings, um, the the dates of the reigns are wrong. This is very important because you're, when you're reading through them, you're going to realize that the dates don't add up. So it's very, very important to mention this, okay? Um, don't, get, don't get too concerned about this. If you're going through and you're like, oh, these dates don't add up, this contradicts this. Hold on, hold on. Uh, the reason for that is because there's numerous calendars being used. Okay, so let me break it down in a very simple way. Uh, first off, not all calendars reckoned the first year of a king's of a king's rule as his first year. So, like, let's say, for instance, you started reigning in February. It would say that you reigned your 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 reigning year started the next year but not always. Some different people with different calendars would reckon it from the point that they exceeded to the king. Okay, So um, th- there's that. Uh, and then there's the issue that different calendars for different people groups start on different times of the year. So the Jewish calendar might start on this month, but the Babylonian calendar starts on this month. Now, why is that important? Because kings switches between the calendars and the reckoning. It doesn't have one set standard. So what that means for you is that when you read your Bible, the dates are not going to add up, okay? So don't get concerned about this. This is not a contradiction. It's just you citing different calendars at different different reigns, okay? So <laughs> uh, I need to really mention that. Uh, the third thing to mention with First and Second Kings, um, it follows the same basic format throughout the book. Excuse me. <coughs> throughout the book. It'll introduce a king. It'll give an evaluation. Uh, it'll give a reference to, hey, hey, is it not written in so-and-so book? And then it'll kind of mention his death and his succession, that kind of stuff. Um, and it follows this, the same pattern all throughout. The fourth thing to mention about kings, um, Solomon's reign is detailed. It takes up like half of first kings. Uh, but he's really the only king that gets a lengthy treatment. Um, yeah. uh, and there is, uh, m- m- more so in the second half of his reign than the first half of his reign, there's an implied criticism in light of Deuteronomy. So in Deuteronomy, it says, hey, when you get a king, make sure that they don't do these things. And then in 1 Kings, it shows how Solomon did all those things. Hey, do make sure that your king doesn't have a bunch of horses. So then Solomon amassed a bunch of horses. Hey, make sure that your king doesn't make gold and, and wealth too plentiful. So Solomon made gold like uh, li- uh, like uh, the, the gravel on the, on the road, or I forget exactly how it says it. But moral of the story being he's going through all these different things, and all the things that Deuteronomy is told kings not to do, uh, Solomon does. Because remember, he's wise, so he doesn't have to follow the law. Well, that's what he thought. Um, so the fifth thing about First Kings, er, First and Second Kings, uh, is whereas Deuteronomy kind of gave us the idea, it gave us the concepts, hey, this is how my people should live. In Kings, you kind of see Deuteronomy in action. So Deuteronomy said, hey, if you do this, there's curses and blessings. Okay, do this for curses, do this for blessings. Well, in First and Second Kings, we actually see that played out. They did this, God cursed them. They did this, God blessed them. And so you kind of see Deuteronomy in action. Uh, the sixth thing, don't fall into the mistake that a lot of people do that Kings is pointless history. I hope over the past a couple months, you guys have gotten this one thing. The Israelites recorded things for a reason. Okay, so uh, they recorded genealogies. 
not for the sake of having genealogies, because they, they believed that the genealogies proved something, that they had some theological importance. We looked at that with the story of Enoch. Um, and so then the same is true for this. They believed that history was unique, that God interacted in history, and that these things had very specific things to teach us. The Bible is not a history book. Uh, it's not pointless history. It's historical narrative. He's using the history that actually did happen, but he's using it for a reason to tell something, to narrate something. The seventh thing, <coughs> um, there I, I know with it being called kings, you would think that the issue being discussed is the morality of the king. But the emphasis throughout the books is really the morality of the nation. It's not just the kings. The kings are more like, not forerunners, but kind of like the king will stand for the whole of the nation. Like, oh, this is what the king is doing. And you can kind of put together the people are doing the same thing, you know. And so it, it's, it's the king is the one getting all the tension, but the whole people are going astray. Yeah. Uh, the eighth thing about kings uh, is it brings up a series of questions. Was Solomon always wise, or was he only wise for part of his life? Because in Ecclesiastes, he says that he goes and sins, but wisdom remained with him. But to live in sin isn't wisdom. So you're kind of left with this situation of, was he no longer wise and didn't know it? Or was God intervening on his behalf to help him understand that what he was doing was wrong and he was just ignoring it? I don't know. Uh, then the second thing, was he wise in sin, which I just mentioned? And then that brings us to a third question, what is wisdom? I, I know we all know wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, as it applies in this situation, what is wisdom? Because, you know, if, if Solomon lives like that, can we really call that wisdom? Because he thought he was still wise, but was he? I don't know. Uh, and then there's something else that kind of falls by the wayside whenever you're talking about Solomon's wisdom. Solomon isn't the wisest person to have ever lived. The, uh, I, I, I feel like sometimes we miss this. Jesus lived on the earth too. Okay, he was At the time, he was the wisest person. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean for all time. Okay, There's lots of things that he didn't know. And once again, Jesus did live on the earth. It's not about knowledge, it's about wisdom, and Jesus obviously had him beat on both accounts. Uh, I think that the one who made the stars kind of understands a little bit more about the stars <laughs> than Solomon does, but whatever. Um, some important dates that I want to tell you before I go to the last couple things. Uh, this is just for your own record. Um, Israel fell in 722, if you're interested. Uh, Judah fell in 586, and Cyrus allowed uh, uh, the Israelites to go back in 538, 539. Um, that brings up an interesting question that um, I had. I don't know if you guys had. The Bible is absolutely clear that it's 70 years in exile. So the question is, how does 586 to 538 or 539, how does that add up to 70 years? Uh, my math's not great, but I don't think that that's 70 years. Well, there's two ways to reckon it. Um, well, there's four ways. So I'll go through them. The first way, you reckon from 586, which is the final time that Judah fell, to 516, which is when the temple was rebuilt. So in that sense, you could say that they were in um, an exile from the point that the temple was destroyed to rebuild, you know, because they were still not really. The first thing they did when they went back to the promised land is rebuild the temple. Uh, they didn't do the, the walls until after that. So you could count like that. The second way of counting it is from 608 to 538. But I don't know why you would count from 608 because Babylonia's first attack was in 605. So I'm not exactly sure why you would reckon it that way. But if you did, then when Cyrus allowed them to return back to um, from captivity, that would be 538. So that would be the 70 years there. Uh, so then the... Then the other two. Number three... It's possible that 70 is more of a rounded number. It's not exactly 70 years. And then the fourth option uh, is that God simply relented. So God said, in all these prophets, all these different times, it's going to be 70 years. But when it got closer to 70 years, God just said, that uh, they've suffered enough and let them go back. All those, I'll let you guys kind of figure out on your own. I know what I uh, think, but I'll let you guys figure out for yourselves. Uh, number nine, uh, the fr ninth thing to consider about the books of Kings there is much more evidence for the things that happen in the Bible the later you get. So when you're looking at, for instance, archaeological proof of Abraham, kind of slim. He lived a long time ago, and he really didn't leave any records. Uh, 
uh, he's, you know, this nomad just wandering around. W- what is he really going to leave? He had sheep. Like, he did wasn't, like, writing, you know, documents or anything. Uh, but then when you get down to Kings, you see more and more, uh, you, you go down and just more and more uh, proof. Um, numerous things have been found that reference, for instance, the House of Omri, uh, which is uh, one of the kingdoms of the north, or I shouldn't say kingdoms, one of the kingly lines of the north. Um, and different things like that, different uh, king, uh, there's a little thing, I forget what it's called, but uh, it's like a print uh, that has Jehoiakim on it. Um, there's um, the David, w- there's three different trustworthy uh, remains that mention David, um, possibly possibly another one. Uh, but there, there's a lot a lot more information, a lot more evidence for the things happening later on, and maybe some t- someday you know we'll talk about them but um the thing is there's a lot of information that's lost that was lost um until a couple years now there's still a lot of information that's lost but i don't think people realize this there was so much information that was lost that there was a good part of history that that people didn't even think that the babylonians were real and so the bible said hey there were these people called babylonians and they kicked us out of our land Oh, the Bible is just making stuff up. There were no people called the Babylonians. And then, you know, starting in the 1800s and, and on from there, things started being found and being found. And now all of a sudden people are like, oh, well, the Bible is is not trustworthy, even though it was proving people pr- that we didn't even know existed. You know, I, I find that odd. It's like people only take the parts of history that validate the thing that they already want to believe. Um, I don't know, whatever. And uh, so the Bible has numerous times indicated that we were lacking in knowledge. <laughs> the the tenth thing to mention about, uh, to consider about the books of Kings, it kind of seems when you're reading through first and saying Kings, it has this thing where you're talking about Kings and it kind of interrupts itself to tell us about prophets. So you have Elijah and Elisha, for instance. And, uh, what does this have to do with anything? Why, why are you mentioning this? We're talking about Kings. And I think that th- why it seems like that to us is because we don't understand the prophetic nature of first and second Kings. Prophets weren't just people who told the future. They were people who called people to obey and listen to God. And at the core, that's what First and Second Kings is about. Hey, obey the Lord. Uh, it, it is a very much a prophetic book. It's calling people to turn to God. By glossing over all the years, what Kings is able to do is it's able to highlight prophecies and show God's interaction with Israel through the years. A great example of this is there's this king um, that, you know, is, is sick, and a prophet comes up to him and says, hey, uh, you're, you're going to live. And he's like, okay. Uh, and here's a sign. He's like, okay, you take this and, and, and hit it on the ground. He hits it three times. And he says, why did you only hit it three times? If you would have hit it more, you'd, you would have won more. But now you're only going to beat Syria three times. And so then later, it records Syria being beated three, uh, beaten three times, and then it says, very clearly it says, he defeated Syria three times. Now, it's able to do that kind of stuff by showing prophecy and then fulfillment over and over again throughout the book. And by uh, showing this glossary uh, uh, format, it's able to do that a lot more. Uh, so First and Second Kings definitely does claim to be a prophetic book. And when you're reading through it, uh, remember that, uh, that uh, the prophets aren't, in aren't interruptions to the story. It is showing how what formed the, the nation. It's showing God's promises. It's showing God's interaction and, and trying to save the, n- save the nation and the people. A lot of different things like that. So when was it written? It was written sometime before Cyrus sent the captives uh, back. So sometime be- be- before 538, 539, some, sometime before that, maybe 560. That, that, might, that might be a good, a good guess. Uh, and the reason why that is my guess um, is because as, as numerous scholars who are much smarter than myself uh, have pointed out, the book ends um, with some events that are happening around the 560s. So anyways... Um, So that's when it was written. When did the events happen? Um, they happened from 970, which was pretty much the end of King David's reign, all the way down to, as I said, about 561. Um, the author, once again, there is no certainty. There's a possibility that it's Jeremiah or uh, the prophets. It seems like Jeremiah had a little bit of a, a group of prophets gathered around himself. That's possible, but once again, his name is nowhere in the book. Um, so it's more of just a, what's it called, urban myth? <laughs> Uh, so then, uh, as far as the main theme of the books, book, books, whatever, 
really consequences of sin. That's really the main idea of First and Second Kings, talking about the consequences. Yeah, obviously, you see, you do see God's promises remaining, though. For instance, the way that the book ends at the very end of the book, it it, it tells this little th- this little snippet of David's uh, heir in captivity still alive, uh, which is his way of saying, "Hey, we're still standing on God's promise." He said that he would he would always have a, a child of David on on the on the uh, throne, and he's still alive. <laughs> so you can see him kind of. These are the bad things, and but there is still hope in the distance. Uh, and like I mentioned, um, another main theme is kind of the law in reality, taking it back to simple, taking it past simple, the l- simple law, and, and kind of combining it with stories about the law. Uh, the outline of the book then can be broken down relatively easy. Chapters one through th- one through eleven would be the United Kingdom under Solomon, uh, and a little bit under Rehoboam. Uh, and then chapter 12, all the way to 2 Kings chapter 17, is the divided kingdom. And then you get to chapters 18 through 25, which is Judah is alone. Uh, so just in case you didn't know or I didn't make it clear or whatever, uh, Israel was separated into two nations, the north and the south. They were called by Israel and Judah or by uh, Ephraim and, or Joseph and, and Judah. A lot of different names like that. Um, and then the last couple of chapters of Second Kings, J- Judah is alone. Uh, the northern kingdom was defeated by uh, Assyria, and the south was defeated later by the Babylonian Empire, which had also conquered Assyria. So, so what? What does it matter that Kings is in our Bible? Well, it might seem a pointless uh, redundancy to have Kings and Chronicles uh, in our Bible. And we're going to talk about Chronicles next week. But they they both tell similar stories, but not all the things that are recorded in one are repeated in the other one. Uh, and they both have different themes to them, whereas Kings wants to show more of an explanation as to why what happened happened. Chronicles more wants to show hope for the future. So it's a total, totally different vibe. Uh, Chronicles was kind of written, in, to put it in modern terms that we can understand, think of Chronicles being wi- written by a worship leader, you know, or pastor or something. He, he's trying to show the different religious, spiritual background. And think of First Kings, uh, more, t- uh, m- more the books of Kings being written more uh, by one of those uh, evangelists that are talking about hell and fire and brimstone and stuff. It's just a totally different vibe to the two different books. Um, so, so what? Uh, Kings gave important justification for why Israel was not in the promised land. Because, once again, this is huge for them. For us, we look back and we say, yeah, it was your own fault, stupid. But back then, they had this idea, God's promises can't fail. Therefore, whatever we do, God will forgive us for it because we're his people. And that didn't work out so well for them. And so they were very disillusioned. They were out of the land. Things just seemed very dark. And so Kings was a very important book for that time. They were still in exile. It gave important justification. Um, It wasn't God abandoning. It was consequences. Another thing is, this is how you know that we are prideful, okay? Think, consider this. Solomon, the wisest guy, right, blessed with his wisdom by God himself, kind of a big deal. Um, I don't think any of us have ever had that conversation with God. This is kind of a big deal. And yet, he did not think he could fall. And also, he still did, <laughs> And so then we take that and we say something along the lines of this, I also don't think that I can fall. I know I'm not as wise as Solomon, and I'm assuming you guys aren't either, uh, mostly because it, the Bible really goes out of its way to show how wise this guy is. And, um, and he still fell, and that should make us think, wow, anybody can fall. I need to be on my guard. But instead we do this thing, and this is, this is how we know that we're so prideful, because somewhere in our head we always think, that won't happen to me. <laughs> that's not going to happen to my marriage. That's not going to happen to my uh, to my spiritual walk with God. That's not going to happen with my kids. And it's like, well, <laughs> then you get there and, you know, curveball. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, another thing that we see from, uh, another important thing about kings is Israel and their kings could have been very good examples for us. Go and do this. But instead, they are a bad example to us, as Israel normally is. <laughs> Almost always when Israel is an example, it's a bad example. Don't do like they did and, and, and do this. Don't do like they did and do this. Well, that's exactly what we see in, in the books of Kings. 
uh, hey, you know, this is what all these people did, and God brought curses on them. Don't do that. And the whole time, they could have been walking in blessings, and they could have been a good example. So any questions about any of these books we looked at tonight? No? Okay, next week we will pick up with First and Second Chronicles. We're kind of looking at, looking at that together. And then Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah. We're going to look at that together. Uh, yeah. So, Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, help us to, to always be learners and uh, that you would bless those who are, who are gathered, that as they read through your Bible uh, throughout the year, you would, you would just give them fresh revelation that they'd, they'd see things that they'd never seen, that in their prayer times they'd, they'd hear from you in a way that they never have before, uh, that you would lead us forward uh, into things we haven't known, things that we haven't done. And, uh, uh, yeah, Lord, that you would um, guide and direct our steps. We love you, Lord. Amen.